what's most important, which is serving your community and not dealing with a bunch of technical stuff. So yeah. <laughs> you leave that to us and we'll be ready to rock and roll. Awesome. All right. Uh, any questions before we get started? Feel free to put them in the chat. And otherwise, um, we welcome you. Oh, Sandra from Rancho Santa Fe. Oh, oh David from Castle. Bay. Alan's back. Hey, Alan, thanks for joining <laughs> us. Fire District. Awesome. All right. Okay. We'd love to say hi to everybody. It's always fun. <laughs> So how do we get here? Um, let's talk about the state of you know cybersecurity and districts today. So what's really interesting is that people used to think like cybersecurity, well, that doesn't affect us physically. We're a district, we're a cemetery district, we're a water district. What what on earth could possibly affect us? Yeah. Well, here's what happened. So <laughs> Oldsmar, Florida really changed to that. And this was just like a year and a half ago. What happened is um, an operator was sitting at their computer station at night and they noticed the mouse was moving, but they weren't moving it. It was a very like frightening situation. And so they started checking things. Fortunately, they realized that, you know, a, probably a state sponsored hacker had come into the system and they'd increased the amount of lye that was being added to the water and they poisoned the water supply. Virtual attack physical consequences. Fortunately, uh, because the operator noticed that the mouse was moving and they weren't moving it, they were able to flush out the water system. You know, it was an expensive process, disruptive, but ultimately no lives were lost, no widespread poisoning. But this was a wake up call. Yeah, that's pretty terrifying. And that's a pretty extreme example of like how poorly it can go. Um, but, you know, think about all of the public information that you have. If you collect account information, maybe mm -hmm. bank account information, any sort of that, you know, for any of your customers, all of that is at risk and maybe all of your personal employee information as well. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things to protect and keep in mind um, as you do serve the public here. So absolutely. And then um, next is we're going to talk about cyber insurance. Oh, this is always a hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> and we did quiz format. Yeah. It'd be even more fun. So let's talk about premium hikes. Okay. How much have premiums increased? I know when we gave this presentation in Colorado, they actually guessed it right. I know. Somebody had just done the renewal. Yeah. They were like, okay, we validated. So we know this, at least in Colorado, is accurate as of a month and a half ago. Yeah. So anyway, please type into chat what you think premium hikes have gone up to just in this past year on renewals. 28%. That's very precise. <laughs> I love, love that level of precision. Any other guesses or is Bridget going to run away with the prize? <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. All right, Bridget, you win just because you were the fastest to type it in. Premium rates surprisingly gone up 300%, if you can believe that. 300. So this is what we're seeing in terms of rate increases. Mm -hmm. And this is due for uh, due to all the kind of risks that we'll talk about shortly. Yeah. There's a lot. Now, another area is reduction of cyber coverage. So normally, you know, and we're seeing some of these things in fire too. Like yeah. what about the amount of coverage? So the standard issue used to be about 5 million for your medium sized average special district. Now, what is it? Any guesses? What do you think it is, Maria? Well, you've given this oh, yeah. before, you know already. <laughs> oh, Wayne said $100,000. Okay. So okay. Five, th 5 million down to 100,000. 3.5. Bridget's still being very okay. precise. Excuse me, okay, yeah, one, one more. Any other guesses? And we have MAH at 1 million. Oh, 1 million. Okay, perfect. 5 million. Sandra, 5 okay. million. So the reduction is either to 3 million or $1 million policies. Yeah. So we're seeing a big squeeze down. Yeah. And even in California, we gave this talk in California um, and Colorado, as Mac mentioned, some people aren't even covering it anymore. They're just trying to eliminate. They're just cyber. getting declined. Yeah. They're yeah. just saying we're not going to cover it anymore because they don't know, mm -hmm. you know, how extreme it can get. And you've probably heard about like the state of Colorado. I think their homepage website was hacked. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are just kind of pulling away because they don't know the yeah. ramifications. That it, they don't know the technology mm -hmm. and how far can go. So yep. it's pretty scary. And last, um, what percentage of attacks are against organizations of 250 employees or less? Is this the, the old way of doing things is that we just attacked the big things, just the mm -hmm. banks, yeah. just the, you know, the statewide organizations. Of course, they're still a target, but what percentage are now targeting smaller oh, wars? Okay. Oh, Ooh. Taylor. Taylor got it. Oh. <laughs> All right. Taylor gets the prize on this one. Half. Okay. So 50% right on the money. Um, nearly half of attacks are now 
on smaller organizations. So we'll really go true. into that as well as to why that mm -hmm. happens. Um, and now, like if you do want coverage, so I know the pools, I, we talked to um, SDRMA in California, you know, Ellen and she was just talking about, man, it's harder and harder to get underwriting for mm -hmm. this. And we're just getting people flat out declined. Yeah. And now it's kind of like, uh, you know, um, driver's insurance. Like if you have a, or car insurance, if you are driving around in a car, now it's like uh, they make sure you have a license. They make sure you don't have too many points on your record. It's like, right. well, the same things are kind of coming out for cyber. So you now have to show that you're getting training, show that you're meeting these requirements. Right. And that would help all of this yeah. move along. So what's right. at stake? So a lot of people think, okay, it can be kind of scary. You know, the lie example we, we were shown, um, you know, with private information as well. But there's a lot more that can go beyond just a simple cyber attack. Um, or risk of cybersecurity. We have a few examples here of how far it can go. Number one, you can have stolen money. You know, they can have ask for money. They can get into your account, steal that money. They can embezzle, have some fraud. They can be, say they're, you know, somebody can come in and say they're Matt Clemens and make changes on Streamline five years down the road due to cybersecurity issues. Maybe they can do my email too. <laughs> help me get through it. Go through all his oh, task shit. lists, assign everything else to Maria. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, maybe that's okay. <laughs> um, but even the last one I think is really important, the reputational harm. Yeah. You know, you're serving the public and it just doesn't look great. How many times have you seen, you know, somebody had some fake news about you or maybe there was an embezzlement through a mm -hmm. board member, you know, and how long that took to fight that news and really, mm -hmm. you know, restore the narrative and do the right thing. Well, cybersecurity, you're not just putting yourself at risk, you're putting the entire community there. Mm -hmm. You don't want that reputation out there because everything you all do is for the better of your community. You're working mm -hmm. hard every single day and you don't want one little thing to kind of ruin that all. So mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to give you some easy tips today on how you can protect your district and yourself. Awesome. And ransomware, yeah. like this is one of the largest and most like, prevalent nuisances with respect yeah. to cybersecurity. And this still comes up again and again. And the average is now so much higher. So it's like been continuing to increase. And um, like the it used to be just a few million dollars. Like in 2020, you heard about the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, 4.4 million. Then UHS in 2021, 67 million. Yeah. I know even like my Garmin watch, they had like a cyber thing and like really? I couldn't get my data for a week. Fortunately, wow. they, they were able to fix it and get it back yeah. up. But I mean, it's just like, wow, there's so yeah. many things that come up. So what we're doing today is we are going into the science of protection. And there's like these possibility matrices that are used in security for like, if you want to open a safe, there's all the ways that you can get there. Mm -hmm. And if we can eliminate a few possibilities, like snip some possibilities out of the threat matrix, then it can provide you with enormous protection. And in cybersecurity, it looks more like this, <laughs> but we don't want this to be your takeaway from the presentation. We want to give you 10 tips that will actually eliminate 90%, like more than 90% of the threats that can affect a special district yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Imagine even going back to this slide here, like there are a bunch of little doors on the outside. If you're able to kind of lock one door securely, that locks all of the doors, you know, mm -hmm. once you walk in there. So yeah. These little practices may seem very simple, uh, but they actually have an immense power um, to protecting your entire district. Yeah, and we worked with uh, TLC Tech and Michael Nelson and others who work in the security field, um, specifically for public agencies and special districts, and have taken actuarial science on like, what are driving insurance claims? What are the most common breaches? And so it's really nice, like this list will fully like practically fully protect you and if not fully protect you severely limit mm -hmm. your exposure as a result of following them yeah so we're super excited yeah. to present them to you today and we're going to make sure that they're easy and they're straightforward i mean some of them are unfortunately like a little bit complex <laughs> but it's our job yeah. like maria and i want to put this in plain english and leave you today feeling safer feeling more aware mm -hmm. and we're also here if you have any questions mm -hmm. we don't like sell any security products or yeah. anything it's you know streamline is a a technology platform, but it powers enormous organizations, you know, not just Streamline, but it also powers some pension systems too. And we have to, we've gone through some immense like cybersecurity training and stuff ourselves, mm -hmm. and we're still learning new things all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so this matters a lot to us. And we share this just because we love special districts yeah. and we don't want to see 
he will be taking advantage of you. Yeah, exactly. Upset. Okay, awesome. So the first one, very simple, um, two-factor authentication. Um, you might see multi-factor authentication to the MFA. Um, this is pretty simple. It's something that, you know, your Google account, maybe your phone, you might already do that already. Um, essentially, it's just asking, you know, once you log into your Microsoft account, um, you enter in your password. That's one factor. Here's the second factor. If something gets sent to your phone, you know, you have to type in that code. I know it can be kind of annoying sometimes to do that, but it has immense power in protecting you. Because if somebody happened to have my password, maybe I left it up at the you know, lo local library computer, maybe somebody hacked into my computer, they can't get that information. They can't get into my email because mm -hmm. I have my phone and I have that code. Yeah. So that's a nice and easy way to knock that out. Something you can easily do after this, you know, this webinar, go back to your office and make sure everybody turns it on. Very simple. So the question is like, you ask yourself, when I log into my special district email, do I have to put in a code or have I ever had to put in a code? Or can I just, can anybody hop on any computer if they know my username and password and sign in as me? Mm -hmm. Because how these breaches happen is that they get your password because you might've used that password somewhere else and that something else breached. And then they go try your email and that and any found password to get in. Yeah. And that two factor will block it. Exactly. But when you lose control of email, then it, you can't reset passwords. You can't yeah. do other things. It's bad news. Yeah. The second, um, and, and if you want to know how to enable that, there's other resources and stuff that we'll send out later. But it's basically whoever manages your email should and can mm -hmm. turn on two factor authentication or multi factor authentication for your whole workspace. Yeah. So that's definitely something you want to do. The second I'll talk about is advanced threat protection. So this is another thing that can be enabled on top of this. So, I mean, how many of you are on um, Microsoft Office 360? Um, if you're on Gmail or Google for your email, this is automatically enabled. And if you're on Microsoft, this can be turned on. And what this is, it does is it checks your attachments, kind of like putting them in a, a bomb blast chamber. Yeah. It like touches them, pokes them, enables them, switches them on. It's a really cool technology to really make sure that nothing can come in those attachments that would harm you, including viruses mm -hmm. or bugs that haven't even been discovered yet. Exactly. Yeah. Some I've had a couple of emails from past districts that may have been hacked and they I get a random email like, hey Maria, can you help me out with this? You know, and, and download this or click this link. And my Gmail will have like a bright orange notification saying, this looks dangerous. This doesn't look right. And then I know. So you don't even have to think about it. Your new employee, your board member who has an email, they don't even have to think about it. Gmail or the service will actually tell you and warn you ahead of time. So mm -hmm. very easy. Again, you can easily turn it on for free uh, for most services. Right. Um, next is being suspicious of email mm -hmm. well i know we've hit on email three times yeah. now but like it's a big one yeah because email attacks as you can see are the worst once they get <laughs> into you know your email account if you click on something you click on a link it could download software that can mm -hmm. go into your entire computer and infect like a little virus there they can also get into your account you know and get resetting passwords for your bank account information mm -hmm. for your quickbooks account for your SCADA systems i mean it could go on and on and on so you really want to be suspicious of every single email that comes through, even if it's from somebody that you talk to every single day. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into a couple examples of that. Exactly. So, and I love some good examples and these <laughs> are real world examples yeah. of like some phishing emails. Yeah. So here's one. This is one of my favorites yeah. in the sense that like, it really shows it's, it's a trick. So this is a warning and you think what you're seeing is like a windows user alert but it's not actually from Windows. If we look closer, and it's like kind of small, hard to see, maybe I can make it bigger. It's from no reply, M Steam at Outlook. Like this is not from Microsoft. This is from somebody who set up a free account and is using it. And this is saying, oh no, there's somebody who's signed in from Lagos, Nigeria. It's not true. What it's trying to do is have you click the button, review recent activity, and then on a lookalike site, capture your username and password. Mm -hmm. So the rule here is just like most attacks work when people get slightly afraid because they don't think as rationally, they just act, react impulsively. Yeah. So the great rule, like with email, there's no such thing as an email emergency. You can always just sit, 
wait yeah. and check on it. Um, you know, you can go get a cup of coffee and then come back and think about it. Yeah. You don't ever have to take action. Yeah. And um, yes. Oh, okay. Now we're getting a question. Due to our remoteness and unstable network connections, all of our computers were set up um, Windows 11 without Microsoft enabled. Is there a different oh option that doesn't require network connectivity? Mm. That's a great question. I think that there is, and I'll love to follow up with you on that. Um, I'll, I'll give you the email at the end. Michael said something about the kinds that are app-based yeah. don't need an internet connection. They are just a uh, time-based key. And so I think there's a solution to that. And yeah. we, we, we can talk about that and give you more information at the end. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, this is always a fun story. <laughs> this actually happened to us um, yes. here. And so this is a great example. It's kind of like looking at like all of your emergency exits. I don't know if that's a, the best way to say it, but mm -hmm. there's several things you want to check out when you get an email. And like Max said, if you can go get a cup of coffee, come back, sit and reread it, then you're doing the right job. So this email seems pretty simple. This is from Matt Clemens to an employee, Dave. And it said, hi, Dave, I'm planning to surprise staff with gifts, compensate them, motivate them. You know, that sounds like Matt, something he would do. Um, and he's considering gift cards, you know, like eBay or Amazon. Um, let me know what you suggest about this plan before going ahead, you know, with the purchase. And he's asking Dave mm -hmm. to purchase all these gift cards. Thanks, Matt Clemens, CEO. La, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks a little bit weird, not great grammar, but, you know, you can <laughs> see a couple of red flags going on right here. So the first one is at the very top, Matt Clemens, Matt Clemens, <laughs> Michael Clemens, you know, however you want to say it, um, hintc209 at gmail.com is definitely not Matt. You know that because we've been emailing right. Matt every single day. But it doesn't always show email. It yeah. just shows name, right? So exactly. it doesn't always pop out. Yeah, yeah. And usually they'll use like a different font too, because it's not so relevant when you look at it. You can mm -hmm. see it's lighter blue. So you really have to be keen in checking that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you'll notice is they ask about confidentiality. A lot of the times when you have phishing, there's going to be urgency and secrecy. Yes. And which is pretty weird. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Mac wouldn't want to keep that so confidential, maybe mm -hmm. keep it as a surprise. But, yeah. you know, wording like that doesn't make so much sense. Mm -hmm. And the last two examples there of the thanks and regards. Parts. Um, it doesn't make sense. It looks like somebody copied and pasted this and they kind of messed mm -hmm. up the template. Um, somebody will not write an email like that. And again, we know Mac, he loves grammar and he always has amazing <laughs> emails. Mm -hmm. um, so it just doesn't make sense. So something is wrong here. But they'll always target, and they still do this. Like every new team member oh, always yeah. gets an email from me. And it's always like, hey, I'm in a hurry. I need you to do this. And they don't want to reach out. It's like, hey, this is a surprise. And our port, we, it's a good yeah. way to actually test the employees yeah. every time. But they always get it. And then they fortunately always check with their manager, like, is Mac really sending me this? Yeah. And then they're like, no, no, yeah. don't give them an Amazon gift card number. Yeah. Uh, but they're just trying to get, you know, they're trying to sneak. Exactly. Uh, this is social engineering. A great example. And your board members too. You know, if you give your board members, yeah. you know, a, a district email too, you might want to make them aware of this mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And here's another thing we love to point out that you can also get spam through your website forms. Now, not all of you have your web have websites that have the ability to accept messages like mm -hmm. on a contact us page, but it's really a wonderful thing. If you can not post an email address and you can instead have a form, it filters out a lot of stuff, which is great. However, there are still sometimes little sneaky messages that come in and they want like this happened to one of our districts in Florida. They got this message couple tips. First is you can always check with us if you've got Streamline or you can check with your service provider. You don't need to respond to technical demands from anybody over email. You just can send it to IT or if it sounds like a lawsuit, send it to legal. But you do not need to react personally or somehow make an evaluation mm -hmm. or defend some report. It's like those things are usually BS. Um, and then the other thing too is like if you get these, don't mark, don't push the mark spam button because you mark might mark your own website as spam because it's your website sending it to you, not this other organization. Your website's just giving you a copy for your information. So if you see this, you go, oh, this is spam. You might want to do the right thing and report it, but just be careful using that mark as spam button mm -hmm. if it's not directly from a, a nefarious sender, mm -hmm. but if it's just from your website. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right. So this is kind of fun as well. Some strategies to help with your staff. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be anything too complex. Maybe have, you know, share this presentation with your staff, maybe at the next staff meeting and go over that. 
And after that meeting, have them set up two-factor auth. Maybe ask them about, you know, phishing strategies. Maybe give them a few examples of saying, is this email real or fake, right? Just a little test there. I know some bigger corporations actually do a higher companies like Breach Secure Now or Bullfish ID, mm -hmm. where they actually will come in there and kind of set up little booby traps mm -hmm. um, for the employees. Like they'll leave like a little USB port um, or a little USB what are those even drive, drive? Key it's been drive. so long since mm -hmm. i've used that in like a parking lot and see if somebody wants to come in and plug it into their some computer. good samaritan like <laughs> oh somebody lost their key here let me plug it into my computer and boom, as soon as they do in buttons. your network yep. yeah <laughs> so you might not have to go that far but there are different ways to make sure that your employees understand you know mm -hmm. how to identify it and what can happen so they really are keen um, to keep an eye out for all of this stuff mm -hmm. but testing testing is how you know mm -hmm. just like you do an external audit do the same thing with exactly. this. Exactly. So then another one is calling when confirming wire payments and transfers. How many of you, you know, by a show of hands, you can click raise hand and zoom. Um, how many of you do wire payments currently? Okay, we've okay, got a couple of hands raised. Sandra, Jason, Kathleen. Awesome. Okay, terrific. So these happen and boy, wire payments have been incredible like yeah. what they have been doing in between like to do fraud on this we've even had title companies fall for this um what happens is you get a little uh monkey in the middle attack it used to be called man in the middle but you know in uh, as things progress it's monkey in the middle and what happens is like they started a conversation michael was telling me the story where they start a conversation between a company and what they did is created kind of like a look-alike address and created a start a message and then start a conversation. They waited for that person to reply back to that false email. And then they created another false email and basically started a conversation back and forth where they were forwarding the message and pretended to be both sides. And it went on and on. Um, they didn't do anything for weeks. They just passed along the messages back and forth. But then when it came time to complete the transaction and the wire information, they changed the wire information and $2 million went to the wrong place. Yeah. So it's like a copy <laughs> and paste, right? They would take one email, put it on top mm -hmm. of each other, hide all of the details. Uh -huh. And that's how they're able to switch out information. And the key, the solution here is, uh, and it can look something like this. It's like, wait a minute, this isn't quite the right phone number. Or this isn't quite the right email. Um, so just a couple of tips, always call your number and your contacts to the vendor to verify, not the number in the email. The other thing you can do is, you know, Google their company directly, call their main line. Mm -hmm. You just independently verify it. Um, and then make sure that any new vendor updated change requires a two-person control. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the banking systems are getting even more sophisticated. They're confirming stuff. You just confirm the bank and nothing, <laughs> nothing works better than a good old fashioned phone call in mm -hmm. many cases to that number, you know. Um, and so those are just best practices. We've seen a few districts get hit with this and we would hate to see any. Yeah. So um the next one is conducting network security testing yeah so this is nice it's kind of like you know testing your own your, your accounting right you want to make sure you're having a, a proper audit so people can come in and do pen testing um and basically what it means is that they're going to run a bunch of fake tests right they're going to try to see where are the the little doors that are open where is it loose and see where they can poke holes um so this is a great way to see okay what do we need to work on and have a priority list from there um, so here's an example um, of what they can look like. They'll give you the high alerts. Um, so if you do have a bigger system, a water system, a lot of customers, and maybe mm -hmm. this is something you're really worried about and you've done two-factor auth, mm -hmm. you might want to uh, consider doing some pen testing just to see um, mm -hmm. where you stand. Yep. And this will be great. If you go to apply for cybersecurity insurance and you've done this, it's terrific. Yeah. There's two kinds of scans. And of course, you know, following the principle of using an outside consultant, you don't have your controller audit your own books, right? You would always use an outside agency. Well, same thing here. It's a really good opportunity um, to make sure that you've got the right folks in the right seats. Um, and in terms of an internal, there's two levels. There's an internal network scan. So if you have SCADA devices, if you're a utility, um, if you have like network things that like old smart Florida yeah. could be hacked to, you know, with a physical consequence, you'll want to do that full internal network security scan. And that can run you between five and 50. We had uh, two audience members call out costs when we were um, at the SDA conference and one was like 15,000, yeah. he said, and they had some SCADA devices. Yeah. The other thing too, um, this is becoming more common as well, website security scans. So just testing your website. 
And what's nice about that is they'll check and make sure that your website doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Because imagine if your like pay my bill link started directing somewhere else and people were paying something else. Yeah. <laughs> like that could be really problematic. You'd yeah. be on the hook for those lost payments. Um, and it would be very embarrassing. Another thing too is to make sure that your website doesn't have connections to your internal network. So I remember there's one, um, mm -hmm. yeah, wastewater district that we were working with in Contra Costa County, and they had a situation where they had an agenda management tool that was like linked from some internal server, and yeah. it had a vulnerability on it, and people could go in through the agenda system and then get into their network. Yeah. So you just want to make sure, like, I know at Streamline, we are very, like, hygienic about the way that the website will not talk to or interact with any services behind the scenes without going through some sort of firewall. Yeah. We just want to remind you, like, there is some good things, even if you don't have an internal network that you could scan just to make sure your website, your domain, your DNS, all of those things are secure. Yeah, yeah. Once again, check far all cheaper, the doors. <laughs> far cheaper, yep. Check all the doors. All right. So this one's always fun. Um, so this is about password protecting your devices. Some of you may be like, duh, Maria, of course. But honestly, <laughs> I've been in so many conferences and asked people to raise their hand. Like how many of you have, you know, a, mm -hmm. a passcode on your phone right now? A lot of people don't. And, you know, it can be kind of a pain to have the passcode and the face ID. You know, we all understand, but that is like the easiest way to like, you're leaving your door wide open, right? Mm -hmm. You're saying, come on in, <laughs> mm -hmm. take whatever you'd like. Um, and so this is essential for your phone because that might have access to your email, your work email, any of those login accounts as well on your computer, mm -hmm. um, any public computers or any other sort of, you know, um, items that you might use for your district. And so this can be personal items and district actual, you know, purchase items as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an essential thing. Again, go back to your staff and just make sure everyone has a passcode on and a mm -hmm. password to their computer. And wow, you've just checked off so many big issues um, on the list. right? Here. And having it under the keyboard doesn't count. Yes. So if you can do this with your keyboard <laughs> and it's written right there, doesn't count. You need to delete. Yes. That. You need to get rid of that post-it and delete it. Now, remembering passwords is hard. So I want to talk about that next. Yeah. Because this is one of the biggest. Yeah. Issues. So this is huge. I think I started using a password manager like five years ago when I started at Streamline. Not only will it make your life so much easier, because as you all know, we have mm -hmm. 50 different passwords and you can't use the same password right. for every account. Oh, and those requirements uh, are so difficult. Yeah. Well, there are password managers and basically it's kind of like a lockbox. Imagine that, that has, you know, all of the keys in there. So every, you know, every other account can have their individual password, mm -hmm. but you need one single password to get in the door to unlock you to everything else. The nice thing about this is that it has the highest level of security. So one password, mm -hmm. Bitwarden, they even use a little key. Um, so you can have two-factor authentication there. LastPass, um, there's a variety of services that mm -hmm. I really recommend that every district checks out mm -hmm. um, for all of your employees just to make your life easier. And that way you have everything under control. Because there's a few benefits. Like one is that it helps ease staff transition problems. Like yeah. this is the number one reason for lockout. It was like, Betty set it up and then Betty left the district and now nobody can get into it. Yeah. Or everybody puts all their passwords in a Word doc on the shared drive because they don't want to lose it. And like both are strategies to try to address the problem. But password managers help so much because A, it will prevent fraudulent lookalike sites from stealing your credentials. And we'll show you an example of that. And that's very powerful. That's like kind of an underrated thing about yeah. these, but like they're not, those password managers aren't fooled. If they're not putting in the password, it's because something's wrong with the website mm -hmm. and they are very like selective about it. They're not tricked. And number three is that if you have, let's say you have a staff person uh, depart under like not ideal circumstances or, you know, something comes up with their health and you need to know like, what are the systems they were accessing on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised what a hard problem that is. Yeah. If you just ask them, okay, great. What systems are you in? It's like, oh no, password managers, especially when they're set up in a team environment, you have a list of all the systems. Oh, they they had passwords to sign into 14 different things. Oh, I didn't remember they had yeah. QuickBooks access. Right. Oh, I forgot they had a Canvas subscription exactly. or a WordPress thing, or they had access to our domain. It's like, there's so many different tools. And the great thing about password managers is they also give you a list of all the systems you're using. Exactly. And that is very helpful for an audit. Yeah. And looking at these systems too, like now I think 1Password now has a team 
solution as well as okay. Bitwarden. Awesome. Um, most of them have now gotten wise to the fact that like password management isn't just an individual problem, it's an organizational problem. Exactly. So you can input any different things you want and the best tools will help you manage both your personal and your professional credentials both and it keeps them separated so work can't see your amazon yeah. or steal your netflix password exactly yeah and what's nice too is if you use something like google chrome for example um it attaches to google chrome so it always knows once you go to amazon.com it po pops in that password for you so you don't have to like log into three different things to get a password it automatically identifies that and even better on top of that this next example with Evernote, um, it can identify what is a real website. So mm -hmm. for example, let's say you go to evernote.com, you click on a, a spammy link or something like that. And it's mm -hmm. Evernote, but with two E's at the very end. Mm -hmm. You might not realize that it might look like evernote.com. Mm -hmm. Here you go, type in your password and you've just given that away to somebody else. Mm -hmm. These password managers will know, they'll say, nope, that's not the right website. Mm -hmm. And so it'll warn you and it won't even give you the password option. Mm -hmm. So it really protects you without you even realizing it. Yes. Because like, yeah, the, one of the tricks that they used to use is like, instead of a W, they'll replace it with two Vs yes. in the domain name. And it looks just like it. It's like wonder, hmm, wonder.com. Well, the W looks kind of bigger than normal, but I don't know why. It's really two Vs. Like yeah. somebody went out and just bought a domain and made it look the same. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting things. Yeah, it's really helpful. And I know somebody asked us about, you know, the Apple passwords, like the strong ones and how often you should change them. Mm. Oh, um, yeah. It's actually been shown, like you should not be changing your passwords all the time. Mm -hmm. because of humans like myself human error mm -hmm. you're going to forget you're going to have to write it down you're just proposing so many more risks um, you can't remember that password and you keep resetting it um, so have a good password mm -hmm. uh, one that you you know you can remember but not one that's impossible um, and then you're much more likely to have that under control there yeah and what is the most secure password maria um one you can't remember yes <laughs> it's the most secure password is the one you don't know yeah because it's completely random and it's held in your password manager yeah. it's unique you can't mm -hmm. use it anywhere else yeah the most uh, that was one of my favorite takeaways from what michael had told us is like the most secure password is the password you don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is one of the takeaways all right so just three more tips eight nine and ten so first dmark and I put D, huh? <laughs> because, you know, all these technical terms. But this is one thing, it is technical, but we want to bring this in. DMARC is a protocol, domain-based message authentication reporting and compliance. Don't worry, you'll never be quizzed on that. But <laughs> it's a framework that makes sure that you're really sending mail as you. It's authenticated mail. And it's something that anybody can turn on on their email system. And it basically blocks anyone else who's not you from signing email as you. And it's a cool tool. Mm -hmm. And it also helps with deliverability. So yeah. if you ever have a problem where like you're emailing people and it's going into their spam, DMARC can help. Yeah. So at mxtoolbox.com, you can go there, you can click a little DMARC link up there. You can type in your domain. So if it's getstreamline.com yeah. or if it's you know the name of your district where you send email from. And that based off that email address that you put in there, it will check and tell you if your DMARC status passes or not. Yeah. And it's amazing. There's lots of little things there, but that's something you can send to your IT department or to whoever manages your mail and say, hey, I ran an MX toolbox check and I noticed we have some issues with our site or with our email. And they'll be like, very impressed. Yeah. <laughs> but it also gives them something they can check against to fix the problem and then let you know that it's resolved. Yeah. Because your job as a manager or leader at a special district is not to know all the technical requirements and have all the answers. You don't have to have any of the answers, mm -hmm. but being able to ask the right questions will help people exactly. solve the problems themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this one's always fun. You'd be surprised. So social media. Um, so a lot of companies can aggregate, you know, collect all of this data um, in different ways. And for example, you might post a picture of me and Mac in the office. And if you have your password written, on this, you know, on a little sticky note there, well, now it's on the internet for anyone to identify. And they can actually use AI to identify texts and things like that and really pull it out. Mm -hmm. it's amazing. It's also terrifying. Um, as well, there are games that they can have you play and like a little ad on Facebook or anything like that. Maybe you want to pass the time before your next meeting, um, but they're ask, actually asking you questions about like, 
you know, what was your favorite subject in school? You know, what's your favorite color? What's your mom's maiden names? Like, don't those all sound fairly familiar? Um, you can see an example here about how they've been making the rounds. It sounds like fun. You know, it's something you can easily do, but this is the only answer that you should have. And so it's a little fuzzy here, but this example says, stop giving people your personal info to guess your password and security questions. Mm -hmm. Those Street are the only you grew answers. up on, mother's maiden name, social security number these are just secondary questions that they yeah. can use to get other stuff yeah so stop yeah. just don't do those <laughs> <laughs> and the last tip in addition to not giving away your personal info is to keep learning mm -hmm. every year there are new strategies every year there are new tricks what you're doing today is a perfect example exactly. you're taking time to stay current to learn more yeah. and it makes her day yeah so we're so happy yeah that you're here yeah thank you all for joining <laughs> so we um we're right at time and we'd love to now take a pause take a time out and answer any questions that you might have yes. um and as well these slides will be available for you all after again we totally recommend maybe a staff meeting you know have some pizza or something fun and just have a few of these examples and have everyone you know <laughs> lock all of those doors so you can feel a little bit better Yes, absolutely. Even if you just do one or two or three, yeah, you'll be that much safer. And if you come back next year and listen to this again, we'll have new things yeah. for you to do. All right. Uh, so any questions? Let's see, we got one answered here. Took care of that. We will send out, yeah, like uh, Marie said, just keep a lookout from email from Streamline. Oh, Sandra, you are most welcome. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Many folks, they they take away from this meeting, you know, these tips, and then they have some questions pop up. Feel free to email us. Um, Marie and I are here to help. Yeah. And uh, like I said, we don't sell any security products or anything necessarily, but we love, um, we know a lot of folks in the space. We know people through the associations, mm -hmm. the state associations, the yeah. approved vendors. We'd love to connect you with anybody who could be helpful for your district. Yeah. This is always a fun topic because when you're safer on the web, then yeah. the web is a better exactly. place to be.